Well, welcome to the podcast, Richard. Well, thanks for asking me. Sounds like good fun. No, well, hopefully it is. If you if I see you nodding off halfway through, I'll, I'll give you a prompt to uh, to wake up. But before we start, I just want to say congratulations on winning at Jackson Wild for your film Lions, Bones and Bullets. That that must have been absolutely fantastic. Yeah, I mean, look, the, the win was amazing, but you know, and I can't pretend I haven't got an ego here. What was <laughs> almost more amazing was coming second to Sir David Attenborough in the presenter Ed category. And the film that beat us was called uh, A Life on Our Planet, which I'm sure you've seen. It's one of, I think, his most outstanding pieces of work. So to come second to that as a presenter in presenter in a category called presenter-led, I was pretty knocked out by that, I must say. I didn't think we ever had a cat in hell's chance of, of, of beating Sir David. I, but who cares? I think second ain't bad. Well, if you're going to get beaten by anyone, it might as well be David Attenborough. Yeah, absolutely, sure. <laughs> uh, for those that don't know, just before we move on to Sharks, what, what is the film about that you did, Lions, Phones and Bullets? Well, it should be released on, on one of the streamers, we're hoping within two or three months, so people have a chance to see it, so keep your eyes open for it. What it is, it's, it follows a book I wrote called Cuddle Me, Kill Me. And Cuddle Me, Kill Me was, I hope, a, a valid journalistic look at the practice of industrial-scale farming of lions in South Africa. When I say farming, I really mean industrial farming. I mean, there could be somewhere between 10 and 14,000 captive bred lions in South Africa. So they're breeding them like, like cows, like chickens, like pigs. You know, I don't want to equate the two things, but, but lions are normally supposed to be wild animals. They're not supposed to be domestic animals for consumptive human use. But the, the irony was that whilst we were doing uh, Cuddle Me, Kill Me, the main use of these lions was for something called canned hunting, which is a pretty, pretty horrendous um, form of not hunting, it's just killing. Killing lions basically in enclosures that could be very small or very large, but ultimately they're still enclosures. And uh, then you also have things like cub petting and walking with lions, all exploitive uses. But, but since a film called Blood Lions came out, and since the, the uh, trophy thing has been restricted by United States banning trophy imports, they've had to find a new use for the lions. And here's where it gets really batty. There aren't enough tiger bones in the world to satisfy the demand for tiger wine, tiger cake, and various tiger products. Neither you nor I would ever be able to tell the difference between a lion skeleton and a tiger skeleton. So lions are being bred en masse in South Africa to be sent to Southeast Asia, where they masquerade as tiger skeletons and get processed into tiger cake, tiger wine, tiger, you name it. So it's kind of a con all the way down the line. And the ultimate con is the consumer. If he's getting tiger at all, it's not even tiger, it, it, it's lion. So, so the film um, looks at that. We try to be a, a valid, dispassionate, journalistic look at things but it's quite difficult with a subject like that as I'm sure you'll see not to be swayed pretty quickly just by the sheer horror and yeah. I really hope everyone watches Lions, Bones and Bullets and, and knows about the story because then we can start to put an end to it. I mean it's almost a, a podcast in itself but yeah that that is a, a horrific thing to see so people will be able to watch that on a streaming service at some point in the future basically. Well, let's do it again when we've got a streamer. Eh? <laughs> yeah. That's it. It's a date. It's a date, Richard. Well, look, let's get on to sharks. So what is it that draws you to them and particularly the ones around Britain? Um, I think what draws them to me is that I never grew up, you know. I mean, I never saw the point of being an adult if you could stay a child. And, and yeah, hey, hey. When I was about eight, I went on holiday to Kuwait where my father was in the British Army and I'd spent the whole of the Easter term at boarding school looking forward to swimming in the warm gulf you know the horrible gray leaden skies of january february march britain wow april here i go off to the gulf i got there and my mum said we had the sea bang opposite the house my mum said no swimming this holiday and the reason she said that is because someone had been taken by a shark following one of the large uh, freight boats in in past our house and people chuck refuse off the back of boats so sharks follow boats so i then had a new mission uh, for my holiday. So I sat on the garden wall the whole holiday when I was allowed to, just praying for a fin to go slicing through the water and gobble someone up. You know, that, that's, what <laughs> that's what eight-year-olds do, you know. Um, and I never grew up. So 
Sharks, I mean, to me, they are the most extraordinarily graceful, powerful, um, you know, they, incredible dynamic if you watch their body as it moves. I mean, there's nothing about them that isn't just, just awesome. And that word awesome is way overused. But in this case, it's absolutely appropriate. And British sharks, I wouldn't say I'm particularly attracted to them. What I'm particularly attracted to with regard to British sharks is that people don't know they're there in many ways. You know, we don't know how many species there are just because how do you define what Britain is? How far out from the coast are you going, et cetera, et cetera. But, but you can safely say there's 30 and a bit. Yeah, uh, okay. In Britain. You know, including uh, some, some fantastic guys. You know, we've got blue sharks. We've got the occasional mako. We've got freshers. We've got the second biggest fish in the sea, the basking shark, which I, I discovered some great basking shark stories. I mean, a basking shark once blew up the Royal Navy. You know, we've got brilliant, <laughs> we've got brilliant stories. Um, and, and then a whole well, host of other sharks. You, you, know. can't, you can't drop that, Richard, and not tell the story. How did a basking shark blow up the Royal Navy? Okay, hang on. I'm just going to have to. It'll take me a second. Just to... <laughs> okay, not to put you on the spot, but I, that's too good no, a no, nugget. I, I wasn't kind of expecting it. I should have known better than to, <laughs> to say it. What, okay, what so... I will say while you're doing that is uh, you mentioned about the freights going by and uh, the sharks being attracted. I don't know if you remember a few years ago in the Red Sea, there was a spate of shark attacks, wasn't there? Um, within a I week or two. Well. And, uh, and I was in the Red Sea the week after the week after those shark attacks on a scuba diving holiday. And I can safely say I was shitting myself for that whole week that something would happen. But we didn't see a single shark for the entire week of diving, weirdly enough. So I was worried all that time, but we didn't see any. Well, that, that, that was actually a fascinating case. And I was asked to go on the team that helped to investigate. Ah, so, okay. And it may well have been uh, animals following boats up the Red Sea that were full of uh, sheep and things from Australia for Ramadan. They were chucking the dead ones over the back because those animals shouldn't really have been in the very north of the Red Sea at that particular point in time. They should have been quite a lot further south. Ah. Uh, they, they, they were oceanic white tips. And I didn't go on it. And I mean, um, I'll be careful what I say here now, but I was just a bit worried about the politics of everyone involved at the time. Okay. Uh, so I, I just ducked it and said I had to go on a moon program or something, you know. <laughs> I was going to become an astronaut. That got me out of that. So, okay, here we are. You asked me to tell the story. August the 2nd, 1956, a report came through of the Royal Navy. And what had happened is a team of divers had been, in their language, buzzed by a basking shark off South Cornwall. Now, they didn't think it was a basking shark. They thought it was a, presumably a great white. Okay. So the commander in charge of the divers decided they'd better destroy it. So what they did is they made a kind of bolas device, if you figure a bolas, okay? And each end, instead of the bubble thing, is a lump of plastic explosive. I'm not quite sure how they fused it, but what they did is the idea was they would drop this over the shark as it came skimming past the boat, and it would snag on the fin, and the shark would obligingly swim off and blow up. And everything went pretty much according to plan, except the shark wasn't a white shark, it was a basking shark, and it hadn't really read the script very carefully. Because what it did somehow is it went under one of the boats and blew up under the boat. And so it blew up the Royal Navy with the shark. And actually, it wasn't funny. I mean, we all laugh at this, but I'm going to tell you what happened. I mean, I'm pretty sure someone died. Oh, right. OK. So ultimately, you know, we should, we, it's impossible not to giggle, but obviously a family were involved in a tragedy. Yes. And, and the interesting thing is the shark must have blown itself to pieces because they weren't that far offshore. Uh, and no bits were washed up or anything else. I would just like, if you give me a second, the explosion killed two civilians, Leslie Nye and Richard Kirby, and two Royal Naval men, uh, Commander Brooks and Petty Officer Spicer, were both seriously injured. So I just want to apologise um, for, for in any way finding that amusing to anyone who might be listening, because I certainly wasn't being amused at the death of the humans. No, so no, I... You know... I think people, re yeah, I, I, I appreciate what you're saying. Yeah, it's just a, a, a strange circumstance uh, is probably the best way to, yes, to put that. And you mentioned a few different species of shark there. So I've been on a bit of a spiral recently looking at uh, white shark stories, but I, I did read somewhere, and I don't know if you've got any more information on this, but uh, an anecdote about a salmon shark being caught off the Isle of Wight. I don't know if that rings any bells for you or is, this, is that complete nonsense? Uh, look, I'm not saying it's nonsense at all. It was okay. it's very, it's very odd. But but let's, I mean, salmon sharks and poor beagles are quite closely related. 
that was my thinking so it was um I was watching on a YouTube video and someone was mentioning uh, an anecdote of one being caught off the Isle of Wight. And I thought that's very oddly specific because I know they're very similar to Port Beagles, but um, I, I suspect it without seeing a photo, it's hard to say, isn't it? I, I suspect it's probably a, a big Port Beagle, but you, you, you want, you want sort of an accurate description of the morphology. You want, you want to see a picture. You want to get the fin uh, positions. And you, want, you want to be able to look at the dentition as well. Yeah. Um, you know, so, I don't, I don't know the range of salmon sharks, but I always thought they were Pacific species, not Atlantic. So it would be very lost if it was turning up at the island. I might be wrong on that. Someone might be able to correct me, but I, I, I thought they were Pacific species. Well, you know, wild animals have a massive uh, tendency to make a fool of you. As soon as you make a <laughs> they do. As soon as you make a definite pronouncement. I mean, yeah. that, that, wal that walrus that, that, you know, is from around, I mean, he was, what, hundreds of miles away from where he should have been. Yes, um, yeah. I think it's unlikely. Yeah, animals don't read the field guides, do they? No, they absolutely so they, don't. They not. So the burning question, of course, is then, do you think we've got great whites along the British coastline? Well, I started looking at this question sort of probably in the mid-90s, I'm guessing, maybe the late 80s, because I kept on going, uh, I was tagging a lot of sharks then, kept catching them and, and, and tagging them and so on and so forth. It, it was a different world then. You know, I, I point that out. I mean, I'm not sure how much I agree with tagging anymore, unless it's for specific, defined scientific purposes, because you are stressing the animal no matter how good you think you are. But this was 35 odd years ago. So I kept on hearing stories and, you know, it, it was it became impossible to dismiss them as fishermen's tales. I kept on hearing stories about, you know, big sharks uh, and the, the hints all the time that they were white sharks. And all the stories I heard were basically along the south and north Cornish coasts. So I got interested and I started collecting sightings in the sense that I, I sort of developed a bit of a name as the loony who thought that we had great white sharks. And so if you think you've seen one, ring this guy. And, and I probably looked at over, a, well, well, well over a hundred uh, claimed or suspected instances. Actually, I think it's only 10 or 11 that remain credible. Okay. Uh, Post investigation. And, you know, some of them were absolutely loony. Um, <laughs> well, it almost thing. it almost gets lumped in with like Bigfoot and Nessie, which is weird yeah. because obviously, you know, this is something it's not a mythical animal. There are great whites, you know, in, in the Mediterranean, aren't there? So it's not that big a stretch to think they could turn up here. When uh, when did it happen? It was 1970 something that a female, female about a two meter female, if I remember, uh, was caught off La Rochelle in the northern Bay of Biscay. I mean, that is no distance from, from the British mainland, you know, I mean, about 200 nautical miles or something like that. Well, Nicole managed to swim. You've heard of Nicole, I guess? Nicole was a is this, Yes, is this the one that recently swam the Atlantic or, or, or something like that? Well, there have been several of those which were, which were tagged by some people who know such. But Nicole was the first sort of really... Um, let me just give you that figure. A female in 1997 captured at the north end of the Bay of Biscay off La Rochelle, only 168 nautical miles from Land's End. Wow. Now, before all these O-Search ones were being tagged, in uh, November 2003, an animal called Nicole was tagged off South Africa, uh, and her tag popped off at the end of February, uh, and then we knew she had got to Australia, but then she was spotted again in August back in South Africa. So this guy had swum 22,000 kilometers. Wow. So 194 nautical miles off land, 168, sorry, 90 nautical miles off land then, is really nothing. Yeah. It's not even a walk in the park. It's just, you know, it's tiny. So, yeah, I, 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 th I think we've got them. So I started investigating and I started coming up with loony tales. But I started coming up with some very, very, very good tales as well some tales that remained credible. And I guess as well, the water temperature, I mean, if you take the French one, the water temperature in the Bay of Biscay is not going to be that dissimilar to, say, Cornwall, is it? So temperature is not going to be a barrier to them. Water temperature is perfect. Yeah. Uh, in, in, of, of South Africa, we get uh, similar water temperatures as British waters. Same uh, of uh, Southern California, same of South Australia. You know, I mean, anyone who's ever dived in South Australia, you know, anywhere near where the white sharks are there, I mean, it's bloody cold. And the same with New Zealand. So, you know, if you look at South Africa, for example, um, 
which has got a fantastic uh, population of, of Cape fur seals around Giza Rock and Dar Island, 60,000 Cape fur seals. Um, we've got 35,000 fur seals off North US, off the Monarch Islands. That's a pretty big population of seals. Mm. So the water temperature is right. You know, we, we've got seals all up and down our coastline, and then this big population off North US. Uh, the Monarch Island. So, so why aren't they here? Yeah, it's a real puzzle. My guess is that we get the occasional vagrant visitor. I think the credible sightings that I have logged probably uh, relate to vagrant visitors. Yeah, so that was going to be my next question. So it's it's really it's not a case of if, but really why aren't they here? Because if everything, if the temperature is fine, if there's lots of food. It's, I guess it's just a case, because the Atlantic's not prolific with them, is it, as opposed to other parts of the world? Or is it that we don't know? Well, look, the answer is we don't know. Yeah. Uh, uh, we, we, various global population estimates go from 3,000 to sort of 5,000. And you can read pluses or minuses uh, with both of those figures. I mean, that, first of all, it's a massive differential. One figure is almost nearly double the other. Yeah. So that's a pretty good indication of, of how little we know. Um, but even if you take the top figure, uh, it's not many for all the world's temperate oceans. No, um, no, no. How many are in the North Atlantic? Um, probably not very many at all. And don't forget that there is an attrition rate the whole time uh, as, as we catch sharks. The good news, white shark terms, is that they, the population off, off the other, on the other side of the pond, um, off that side of America, does seem to be improving. And the population of California seems to be improving. So, you know, there are some sort of shining lights in the darkness, but, but I just don't think there's that many. And it's quite interesting because the O-Search tagged sharks, they seem to sort of, putting it sort of simply, swim out into the middle of the Atlantic, turn around and go back. <laughs> um, and so, you know, that, that, that is a bit of a puzzle because there have been several occasions where individual animals have got been tagged and they sort of seem to head straight across and everyone gets very excited, you know. The Daily Mirror starts sharpening its pencil, to lock up the Queen and call out the SAS and God knows what. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then they never get here, you know, which no. is, is, I think, sad. I, mean, I, I really would love proof, um, you know, but, but in my view, what, what's interesting about my credible sightings is that nearly all of them are not singular sightings. I'll have a sighting and then within two or three weeks or sometimes even a year or two, I'll come up with someone else telling the same story in the same piece of water relating to the same time and that just adds to the credibility of that yeah picture. yeah definitely and i guess as well with the sharks that we we have seen where you've got evidence of things like mako and fresher but we don't see many of those a year do it's only a few that are, uh, boat anglers only catch a few each year don't they there's not buckets of them being caught out there Oh, sadly, no. I mean, no. threshers are, are, are more abundant in our waters than, than makos. Yeah. Um, but, you know, no, absolutely not. No. I, uh, I went out to swim with blue sharks. Well, I did it this year in Cornwall, and I tried last year off uh, the Celtic Deeps. We didn't see any off the Celtic Deeps last year, but the week before, a thousand pound mako had been caught by an angling boat. And I can't, there was a kind of equal amount of excitement getting in the water. But a, a healthy, healthy respect is how I'll word it. I could probably word it another way. If that, if I see this thing in the water, my heart is going to jump out of my chest. And we didn't see it, but I saw photos of it being caught the week before, and it was an impressive animal. You know, a mako is a, a very impressive beast. They wouldn't actually. They wouldn't come near you. They wouldn't. Um, no, they, they could be pretty annoying. Uh, I mean, I can remember many times I'm diving with blues and makos when we've been working in the Azores. And the blues will come right up in your face. They'll almost tap on your mask. Yeah. You know? yeah, uh, yeah. And I would, I would sort of carry a little billy to push them away. Because anyone who thinks blue sharks are completely harmless is bonkers. I mean, I've got 34 stitches in one foot. And that was kind of my own fault. But I've also had one on my fin. Uh, and that shark did not know that that fin wasn't my ankle. Yeah. And I thought it was hilariously funny at the time. I waggled my fin around like you play with a dog, you know. But then I realised when I got back on, 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 the, on the boat, I thought, my golly, actually, there you go. Yeah. And, and these, these shark, sharks have been chummed, so they're pretty safe, but you just don't need to regard them as ultra safe and forget all your caution and what have you. But, um, but maybe because you don't need to worry about because annoyingly, what they'll normally do is if you're sort of uh, free diving on the surface with blues and the mako rocks up, it'll stay, um, I don't know, 
10, 12 meters away, and it'll zap around the outside like a sort of Ferrari on speed. You know, they're very fast. I've never managed to get them close. And the same with port beagles. I mean, port beagles, are, they, they won't come in very close at all. You've got a real challenge to get film of port beagles in the water. Yeah, I've, I've seen um, the odd kind of fishermen maybe film them from a boat or something like that, but I've never actually seen... Or I've seen one or two bits of footage of port beagles, but yeah, there's not a lot at all. We, 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 I think we got what is still the only free swimming footage in British waters. Um, oh, and this I... was a number of years back. No, I mean, what we did is we, we were satellite tagging port beagles and we wanted to try and film them. And, and I had a, a, a chum station set off about 15 metres off the boat. And every time I got in the water, one side of the boat tried to sneak out. And we could see the fins on the surface going around and around the chum station. It was just a, like a, you know, a big can, if you like, a, a plastic one, actually, with, with, with mackerel in it. Every time I got out, they'd bug it off. <laughs> and, then, and then, you know, I, I almost thought that they'd, they'd gone away 15 yards. They were sitting there laughing. At Every, then I'd swim back to the boat. And then within five minutes, the, the fins are back around the chum station again. And I got bored with that after about, you know, four or five times. But then what we did is we gave up putting someone in the water. And we just actually put poles over the side with cameras on the end of the poles, and we just, there was no one in the water. Uh, and I think that still remains some of the only free swimming pole beagle because it's shot in the water. I'm just going to kill this phone call. Hang on. That's okay, no worries. I, I can't talk. I'll have to uh, come back to him on a podcast. Bye. Bye. Sorry about that. That's okay, Richard. We've had dogs, children run in, we've had everything. Sorry on. about that. That's absolutely fine. No worries. Recently, I don't know if you saw, there was a story on uh, Bournemouth Beach that was evacuated because something was in the water. And there is obviously this innate yeah. fear with anything with sharks. So is it something people should be concerned with or have you got more chance of winning the lottery than ever seeing anything like this? I think there's two ways to look at that. I mean, yeah, you probably have got more chance of winning the lottery. And I, I personally wouldn't be concerned. Um, I, I suppose if you don't have any experience and you don't evaluate things in your mind, then, then probably it's better to be cautious. Um, I mean, I wrote a book called Shark Attack Britain, which detailed lots of shark attacks in Britain, including our friend the basking shark blowing up the Royal Navy, but has never been what you and I would define as a real shark attack in British waters. There have been some balmy situations, you know, with, with a guy being in a hospital in the Midlands because he fed sharks in his aquarium in his restaurant. But that's hardly a shark attack. Another guy ended up with his hand in the mouth of a poor beagle that he was taking to a restaurant that it slid forward in the back of his van, ended up on his shoulder at a traffic light and put his hand on his shoulder to push it back, but he ended up with his hand in the mouth, and the mouth shut, your wrist, uh, and you're quite lucky that you haven't severed any veins and arteries. Um, but there's never been a real shark attack, so people shouldn't, shouldn't, in my, just be cautious, leave the water, don't panic. So do you think it's a matter of time before we get hard evidence then? Okay, so I, I, I've had what I consider to be highly probable sightings uh, of North Cornwall, of South Cornwall, and off, off the Western Isles in Scotland. Uh, and I believe that we actually already do have hard evidence. It's not hard evidence because I asked the wrong question. You, you may be aware of a photograph that exists that was taken uh, off Dunnet Head uh, near Leicester, near Stradster, in the, in the northeast part of Scotland. And this is of a shark caught in the net, a very large shark. Now, I sent this photograph off to people like Len Campagno and Ian Ferguson and, you know, globally renowned identifiers and experts. And I asked, I said, this was photographed in North, of Northern Scotland. What do you think it can be? And they basically came back and said, well, if you hadn't said Northern Scotland, you just said, what is it? You would have said Great White Shark. So because I said Northern Scotland, they started thinking of what else it could be because there's no confirmed white sharks in British waters in recent years. Uh, so, you know, had I posed a different question, we would have two or three of the world's biggest experts saying, there's a Great White Shark. So, that's the closest we've got to actual evidence. We've got several sightings um, where they're really strong, you know, three or four sightings within a couple of weeks of the same animal. And I'm convinced it's only a matter of time because everybody's got cell phones these days. Cell phones have got good cameras on them. And so the people who in the past, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, my sightings from those decades, they didn't have cameras around. 
Uh, but nowadays, if one of these guys rocks up again, we will get pictures and we'll be able to prove it. And I think it is only a matter of time. We'll see some uh, eventually. And yeah, I think it'll be, I mean, the the, the tabloids will, will have a field day with it, but then they won't be able to publish the the yearly story, stories of, is this the first great white? They'll have to think of something else to moan about. Yeah, that would be a bit. That, that'll be a bit of a dilemma, won't it? For, for, <laughs> for editors looking for stories when Parliament's broken up, you know. Yeah, exactly. Uh, maybe an aquatic Donald Trump will come and threaten British seas or something. Oh God, I hope not. <laughs> that'd, be more, that'd be even more dangerous. I mean, it would I, be. Yeah. yeah. Now, I mean, I want to be there. You know, my great fear is that this will. I spent half the year in Southern Africa doing stuff down there. My big fear is that we're going to have a guy rock up one year when I'm not here and I'll miss out on the chance of getting there because all the evidence suggests that when we get an occasional visitor, they may hang around for a week or two. And so if I got a really credible sighting or, or a photograph that was 90% convincing, I would go straight there and start looking in Chumming. And, okay. and I, would, I would want to be there and I would want to be, I want to be the first guy in the water to get a picture. So, you know, I'll miss out. When was the sort of the last credible uh, sighting then? When, is, when was the most recent one where you think that that certainly could have been something? Um, that's quite an interesting question because it's quite a while ago now. Ah. I just, I'm going to look it up to make sure I get it right. It's probably, let's have a look. I think the last really credible one. Yeah, the last really credible one was, was off the Western Isles in 2007. So... We're looking at a long time. I mean, there used to be more or less sort of every year. I wonder whether it's because people have become a little bit um, less keen to report things. Okay. Um, uh, even the press now seem to be getting the message and sort of not making the thing out of it they used to. Um, and so I certainly get a lot less reports now, a lot less. Yeah. Uh, they they normally turn out to be basking sharks, or they always turn out to be basking sharks and four beagles. But I had about four this summer. Normally, I get about in, in years gone past, I'd maybe get 15, 20. Okay. Um, I don't know why, but I'm not aware of a credible one in the last decade, anyway. No, and, and I guess it's interesting with all these things turning up. I mean, especially off the southwest now, a lot more tuna uh, are being yeah. seen, aren't there? They're doing really well, and there's been uh, sightings, things like swordfish and what are the the big turtles? I can't leatherback turtles, things like that. So yeah. these things do happen. They come out, I guess, as well. It's just a case of like realistically, how there's no one who's actually looking at the moment. And when you look at on the boats, there aren't that many boats out there, are there? So there aren't that many eyes to see them, I guess. So yeah, that's right. I mean, you know, I mean, if, if one goes up to the Monarch Islands um, during the pumping season. How many boats are on the sea side of those islands? None. Yeah. So, you yeah. know, there could be the occasional shark popping in there. It's pretty amazing to think that you've got a seal colony that big producing that many pups and there aren't any predators. You'd think so, wouldn't you? Great you'd think sharks, so. But, but what about other sharks, you know? Yeah, because I yeah. guess so, Mako's ma so ma ma would I'm take a seal, wouldn't they? We get the occasional Absolutely, it's a different feeding action, but yeah, they, they, they take a seal pup anyway. Okay. And lots of seal pups get injured, hauling in and out, and so opportunistic feeding is going to occur on that. Because I mean, I've seen that an awful lot in South Africa. So why wouldn't it be here with our predators here? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I for one, would think it'd be brilliant if we had great whites off the UK. I, I think that would just add to our natural, natural history. history. And it would certainly make a swim off Cornwall a lot more interesting. Yeah, I think, I think it'd be brilliant to add another animal that charismatic, that fantastic to, to our mega marine, uh, marine megafauna would be fantastic. Absolutely. Yeah, I, and, and I must stress, you know, people should not be worried by this. No, 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 no. They, they, they really shouldn't. I mean, um, you know, in the old days, we used to go free swimming with white sharks um, because we were stupid. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, you know, it's, what, why do it when there's a cage? We just wanted to, to have a tattoo. Of the you know, it was a tattoo and T-shirt time. But, you know, having said that, I've, I've swum with some very, very, very calm great white sharks. And provided you give yourself a way out and provided you're sensible, 
I'm not saying they're no threat, of course. Of course, they're not no threat. They're well-known attackers. But um, I, I wouldn't worry if I was uh, on British beaches at all, no. No. Unless, unless a large population turns on measures to what we take in South Africa. Yeah, yeah, it's just, like we said earlier, you've got a pretty slim chance of... Uh... Of seeing one. Well, look, Richard, it's been fascinating talking about the great whites in the UK. And, you know, I look forward to seeing a photo of one at some point, which I'm sure will happen. So thanks for coming on and uh, take care. Yeah, cool. And, you know, let's make a date. I mean, when, when the film comes out, I'm sure that, you know, lots of your lions are such a, an iconic species that they will come out and you will have a lot of photos of them in the background. Uh, so when I can tell you that Netflix has got the film, then perhaps we'll have another chat. That sounds good to me. Look, take care, Richard. Thank you. Bye now.